happy Monday morning. Is it Monday? Yes, it is Monday. <laughs> Pardon me, I have post-vacation uh, issues, including hair <clears throat> and red marks where I've been wearing my mask. So just ignore the hot mess today. And let's get together and study God's Word. We're going to go into 1 Samuel chapter 25 and 30 today, so it's not too much flipping. Last week's lesson was on David's first wife. Her name was Mikkel, if you remember. And um, we learned a lot about who God is um, through her and her ability to survive what was great abandonment and um, infidelity eventually with the women that we're going to talk about today. And today's lesson is David's second and third wife. Now, when I talk about this, you're going to be like, wait, there's polygamy? David committed polygamy? David had plural wives? Are you kidding me? And I, wanna, I wanted to be clear that from the very beginning, God has designed marriage between one man and one woman. And he stuck with that throughout the entire story of Scripture. Even Jesus himself confirmed that that was the design of marriage and that was God's will and intent for it. So when I, when you hear that men took multiple wives, especially men like King David, who's described as being a man after God's own heart, it's pretty shocking. And you think, what, what in the world? Did God condone that? God never did. God never condoned plural marriage and he never instructed his men to continue to marry women and take women into his into their households that were not them. It's a product of sin, and it's a product of men's minds being tainted to think that they can take God's will and word and create it as they would like it to be based on cultural practices or norms. And we know that that is not the case. So I wanted to be clear on that, that David marrying the second and third wife is sin, that it was not a good thing. But I also wanna be clear as we're studying God's word, David and the two two wives from today are still valued in God's sight. And God uses their, their stories, even with the sin, to teach us something about who he is. And the same thing goes with you. If you've done something that you feel like, well, you know, is against God's word, don't feel like it's hopeless. Don't feel like God can't not use you um, and teach you things. The point is to put your eyes forward and take steps in the future that it will align you with his will and his way. So I just wanted to be clear on that before we get started today talking about the other wives of King David. And I also put a link in the description to an apologetics website that kind of it maybe it might help you understand the situation a little bit more if you have more questions. But we're going to move forward in the discussion of these women and what we can learn from them. Now remember, at this time, David has abandoned his first wife, Michal, left her with her father, Saul, and has moved on to try to conquer uh, the area um, to uh, become to set up his kingdom in Israel. David's first wife, her name is Ahinoam, and I wish we knew more about her. We don't. All we know is that she's from a place called Jezreel, and that her story always appears in tandem with David's third wife, Abigail. So it's always Ahinoam and Abigail. So for whatever reason, these two are kind of stuck at the hip and are always referred to as together. We do know that she had several children with David. One was David's firstborn child. Now remember, Michal was barren. She didn't have any children. Um, so this was his firstborn and his name was Amnon. And there were others that they had together. And Amnon's story ties in with a story of David's daughter, which we'll talk about in another study. That's all we know of Ahinoam and uh, wish we knew more. But the third wife, Abigail, we know a lot about. And so that's what we're going to study, focus on most of the time today. When we meet Abigail, she's living with her husband. His name is Nabal in a place called Carmel. And Nabal is very wealthy. It says that he has over 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, which is a huge sign. And he's got all these animals living all over the region because there's so many of them. And he's got shepherds taking care of them in various places. And so he's just a super wealthy man. Let's look at the description that God gives us in his word in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 3. God gives us very detailed descriptions of Nabal and Abigail. It says, Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful. I love that description. But the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. That's our first introduction to Nabal. 
He is harsh and foul, and even his name means fool. And we will see that he definitely acts a fool in our story. So he has all these sheep everywhere and all these goats everywhere. And while David is, you know, around the area uh, trying to work for the lamb, he is protecting Nabal's sheep and his goats and his shepherds. So anytime David's army comes across one of these flocks and a bad guy's trying to bother him, David runs them off. You know, he's taking care of them. And so the shepherds love him. And they love his army and they appreciate the fact that David is always keeping them safe. But there comes a time when the army is run out of supplies and David needs food to feed his men. And so he says, you know what? You guys go down to Nabal because we've been protecting him all this time and ask him for supplies. Ask him for some food and remind him that we've been taking care of him all this time. And so the men do go down into the house of Nabal and ask him specifically for a donation to the cause for help feeding the army. What was this arrogant man's response? Look down in verse 10 and you'll see it. It says, and Nabal answered David's servants, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. So he's referring to the fact that David has broken away from Saul. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men who come from I do not know where? So he's belittling him and he's making him seem like a nobody. And he turned them down flat. And the men ride up and they tell David what happens. And this is David's immediate reaction in verse 13. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword whoa and every man of them strapped on his sword david also strapped on his sword and about 400 men went up after david while 200 remained with the baggage so he takes an army of 400 men do you know what those feet and those horses sounded like as they charge down towards where nabal is living because they're going to kill them all David is ticked off. He's mad. He's hungry. He's watching his men be hungry. He's done nothing but take care of this man, this wealthy man's sheep. And the man had belittled him and refused food. One of the shepherds overheard the conversation between Nabal and David's men. And so he quickly went right into his mistress, Abigail. And he says, Lady, the David's men came down and your husband made fun of them and he refused their food. And I have a really bad feeling that we are all going to die. And so Abigail very quickly commands that all, a whole bunch of supplies be loaded up on as many donkeys as she could get. Figs and grain and raisins and all kinds of food. And she doesn't tell her husband a word. She does it quietly and then she hits the trail. And she is where David's army is coming down. She is headed up. Because she has got to do something or all of them are going to be slaughtered. And so this is what happens. Go to chapter 25. We're going to start in verse 23. It says, When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. His name means fool. He's a fool. Nabal is his name and folly is with him, but I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. So she is saying, if I had run into them, they would have had whatever they needed. I'm so sorry. Let the guilt be on me. But that's not all she does. She's brave enough to warn him in a nice way. She's brave enough to warn him. Because in the very next verse, wor verse, what she said is, The Lord has restrained you from blood guilt this day. And what she's telling young King David is that had you gone down and slaughtered all those people without God's permission, blood guilt would be on your head. Because here I am, here I'm trying to make peace, here I'm bringing your food, blood guilt will not be on your head. How bold of her. 
And she continues, please forgive the, in verse uh, 28, please forgive the trespass of your servant for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. Because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord God and evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. She says, you are the Lord's and you are fighting his battle and evil should not be found in you. <sighs> my sisters, how would things change in this world if we women would speak God's word and call into the hearts and minds of men around us, men that are ours and men that aren't ours. If you find a man acting a fool, if you find a man walking into sin, how much would ch things change if you were brave enough to say, wait a minute, you belong to the Lord. And this is what God says. He has a higher calling for you than vengeance and for infidelity and all the other things that we encounter in this world. God has a higher calling for you. And then skip down to verse 30. And when the Lord has done to, when the Lord God has done to my Lord David, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel. So she's saying, I know you're going to be king. I know you will. My Lord David shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with you, with my Lord, then remember your servant. She's saying, you're trying to work this out in your own hands. You're trying to, to take an action without God. And God is where salvation comes from. This battle is the Lord's, not yours, King David. That's what she reminds him of. And then she says, and when it happens, remember me. Remember that I stopped you from this great sin of slaughtering these people. David is overwhelmed by her gifts and by her speech. And this is his reaction. Look at verse 33. He, he tells her, Blessed be your dis discretion and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. God worked in his mind her words. God spoke through Abigail and worked it in David's mind. And he repeated back to her exactly what she said. God bless you for speaking God's word to me. He got it. He got it. He understood that she was keeping him from sin. And then in verse 35, then David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, go up in peace to your house. So I, see, I have obeyed your voice and I have granted your petition. So he allows her to go back home. When she gets there, Nabal is drunk as a skunk, eating all the food that he could have shared with David's army. Very pleased with himself. He thinks it's funny, probably telling the story over and over again of all the things he said and how he put those men down and sent them on back uh, toward that little King David. So he says he's probably very proud of himself. And it doesn't say that Abigail confronted him, but this is her life. She's probably very used to her husband being like this. And so she probably went to bed, or at least to her room. The next morning, he awakes sober, probably not feeling very well. And Abigail tells him the story of what happened and how she prevented his death and the death of all their household. And it shatters him so badly that it seems like, it doesn't say, but it seems like he had a stroke because it totally incapacitates him. And he lays there for 10 days before he dies. He is dealt with in this situation, not on David's hands, but by the Lord. And as soon as David hears that Nabal has passed, he quickly sends for Abigail. Let's look at verse 40. It says, when the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey and her five young women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. And then, so then we get an update on the three women says, verse 43, David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and both of them became his wives. So there they are in tandem, and that's how they'll be for the rest of the stories. And then we go back to Michal, because it, remember we read this verse uh, last week. It says, Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was of Gollum. 
so his first wife is another man's wife now. He abandoned her. And uh, so she was given to another man living happily, I think. And then that's where we have Abigail and Hinoam starting as pairs. That's not the end of the story. We do have one more story about these two women. Um, if you skip to chapter 30, um, they are staying in a town called Ziklag while David is off running his, um, I don't know, battles and things, uh, doing his duty, trying to, to set up his kingdom. And so the women are staying in this town. And while they're there and the men are all fighting, the Amalekites come in and they raid the town and they take all the women and children hostage, including David's two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail and their, and their children. And they run off with them and burn the city to the ground. And so the news comes to David, wherever he is, I can't remember at the time. And he hears that they've been attacked. And so he runs his army back to Ziklag. And when they arrive there, they see devastation. And this is what happens when they arrive. So skip over to chapter 30, verse 30. It says, And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. So David dearly loved these women and his children and his army as well, their wives and children, and they are devastated that they have been taken. And this is the reaction of the army. David's two wives also have been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. So not only had David's wives been captive, but now his army wants to kill him. They want to keep, they're like, dude, we were out fighting for you and nobody was home protecting our families. And now they've been taken. And so David is broken because his women are lost and he's under death threat because the men are devastated that their wives are gone too. What will he do? Will he listen to what Abigail told him? Will he remember what she said about blood guilt and taking vengeance in his own hands? Let's look. The end of verse six says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And what he does is, and you can read it for yourself later, is he asked the Lord what to do. Right move. He did learn something. Right move. Asked the Lord's permission and God said, go get them. So they saddle up and they ride for three days trying to follow these Amalekites to find their women. And along the way, they run into a, an Egyptian slave who had been serving the Amalekites. And he had gotten sick on the journey and they had left him behind because he was not able to keep up. And so David takes this man and he says, if you show me where they're staying, I will not kill you. If you do this, I will spare your life. And so he's like, sounds like a deal to me. And so he takes him into where the Amalekites are hiding. And it says that David slaughtered Amalekites from twilight one night to twilight the next night. So for 24 hours, they are killing these men that came in and raided and took their wives as captives. And he gets back Anohim, Ahinoam and Abigail and their children. That's the last time we hear of Abigail is that she's been rescued by her husband. She has one son that we know of. There may have been more, but his name is Kiliab. Um, they, he's also known as Daniel. He's just listed in the um, the history, the, the genealogy of David in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 3. Um, he is He's not the oldest, so he's not going to inherit anything. And as a matter of fact, his younger half-brother Solomon is, is who inherits the kingdom of King David um, upon his passing. So we just don't know anything about him. Um, other than that, he was listed. Wish we did. I wish we knew more about Abigail's um, baby son, but we don't. So that's the story of the day. Oh, my pickles. What a story. But I challenge us all to speak God's word and his will and his way and his call into the heart of men around us. Don't be afraid to say, this is what God says, and this is what God wants to do for you. Don't be afraid to challenge and push them in the way.